I'm Sasha Nicole. And I'm Star. And I'm Dr. T. And this is American Therapy, the definitive podcast on all things Black mental health. And we are at a double show today. We actually just had an earlier show. I think everybody is tired, but is still excited because this is a topic that is hot right now. And literally, it's taking place currently throughout the country uh, with this pandemic, this COVID pandemic that's happening. So Star, what are we talking about today? So today, okay now, because this is all the Black people, we want to know, right? So we're going to get real about COVID-19. Okay, where do we go from here? Is it real? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So we have a major guest today, Dr. George C. Benjamin, who is uh, known as one of the nation's most influential physician leaders because he speaks passionately. And we have also our other guests who just joined us. So we're going to bring you in. Hello. Uh, and so Dr. George C. Benjamin, he speaks passionately and eloquently about the health issues having the most impact on our nation today. From his firsthand experience as a physician, he knows what happens when preventative care is not available and when the healthy choice is not the easy choice. He is the executive director of APHA, American Public Health Association, since 2002. And he's leading the association to push to make America the healthiest nation in one generation. He's of Gaithersburg, Maryland, a graduate of the Illinois Institute of Technology and the University of Illinois College of Medicine. He's a board certified internal medicine and fellow of the American College of Physicians, a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, an established administrator, author, and orator. He started his medical career in 1981 in Tacoma, Washington, where he actually managed a 70, 72,000 patient visit ambulatory care service as the chief of the acute illness clinic. Uh, he's also served as a publisher of the nonprofit's monthly publication, uh, and he's a member of the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine, Engineering and Medicine, also serves on boards for many organizations, including Research American Reagan Udall Foundation. In 2016, President Obama appointed Dr. Benjamin to the National Infrastructure Advisory Council, a council that advises the president on how to best to assure the security of the nation's critical infrastructure. And so our other guests today who joined us, we're so excited to have you. We have Dr. E. Oscar Allen, is the Chief of Programs and Services for the National Association of County and City Health Officials, where he oversees over its portfolio of programs, as well as its membership and meeting services. He directs the implementation of programs, promotion, and diversification of funding and assist in raising Nacho's profile through external engagement and partnership development for the advancement of Nacho's mission and the success of the county's almost 3,000 local health departments. He leads Nacho's national response efforts on emergent health threats, such as we're talking about today, COVID-19, Zika, and natural disasters, such as hurricane. He's responsible for personnel management, professional development, among many other things. He began his career in government public health, designed software. Uh, he joined Rockland County Health Department in New York at the beginning of the West Nile virus outbreak, where he developed a model comprehensive educational and surveillance program. He has experienced demonstrated history in working with a variety of national public health sectors. He's a strong community and innovative professional uh, and we are excited to have both of these doctors today to talk to us about all things COVID because as Star mentioned, in, in the black community, and we won't just say the black community, but in many communities, you know, even across the board, um, we, a lot of people are having a hard time processing or understanding the reality of, of what COVID is, if it's real, uh, and if we should, you know, what we should be doing, you know, do we, do we keep staying inside? Do we go inside? You know, we want to go to the bar now, or we want to go to the store. And so, um, and I got it and I'm going, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and say it and take accountability for a star. Dr. T calls me out. I am guilty. I have already been to a restaurant that is seating dine in and, but it had, it had outdoor seating and, um, it was delicious. <laughs> and I say this just to add a little humor because, you know, this is where we are. So, you know, uh, it's, and you know what people don't like, so I've been protesting and the young people out there protesting are like, oh, you know, COVID-19 ain't real because we would have been sick by now. And I'm like, well, you know, you're out there with them. So, <laughs> and I'm okay. so, I mean, God, thank God, thank God, thank God. There you go. So, Dr. Benjamin, if you could start followed by Dr. Allen and just kind of give us your thoughts about 
not only COVID, but the implications of how it's impacting Black America. Because what we do know is that there are disparities in our healthcare system. Um, and and what, I've, what I've seen is that a lot of people, Black, White, whatever you want to call it, are kind of feeling like, I'm over this. I don't care about COVID no more. Yeah. Well, let me just say that, that this disease is real. It disproportionately, if we get it, it disproportionately impacts communities of color. And the original game plan, which was never really explained very well by anybody, was that what we were going to do was because we don't have any kind of medications to treat it, nor a vaccine, was that we knew that if it went through the community like it went through other nations, um, we would have millions of people who would have died. And a health system which had been so overwhelmed that not only people would have died from COVID, but they would have died from other diseases because they simply couldn't get in the door. So the game plan was for all of us to go home, stay in our homes so we didn't infect each other, recognizing that some of us had to go to work, right? Um, you know, someone had to pick up the garbage, someone had to do the grocery stores. But for those of us who could go home, we would go home. And then we would give us some time to build up the capacity in our health system, realizing that at some point we were going to have to leave and go back to work. But we would have a better chance of doing it more safely, meaning that the disease wasn't going to go away and people were still going to get infected. And unfortunately, some people would die, but many, many less because we, we sequestered in our homes. And then slowly, key word is slowly, which by the way, we're not doing, <laughs> reopen our society with better tools. And we have learned a little bit about some medicines that might help a little bit. We're way on our way to developing a vaccine probably, but not before next year. Um, and we've learned a lot about a brand new disease about how to protect ourselves. And we have three tools. Today, we have three really good tools on the preventive side. That's wearing a mask, that's washing your hands, and that's staying six feet away from each other, called physical distancing, some call it social distancing, as much as we can. Now, the problem is, is that was the original game plan. And you're right, people got quarantine fever, they ready to get out, and they're not following the plan. And what will happen is, because somewhere is only, we've only got about maybe 15% on average, our nation has been exposed to this virus. In a nation of 320 million people, that ain't a lot of people infected, you know? And what that means is, that's not, assuming we're immune if you get the disease, that means that people, a lot of people are gonna get sick as we go back out. Okay, and we can talk a little bit about why people of color are more likely to get, you know, sicker if you get the disease. And yep, the folks were out there protesting and yep, they were putting their lives at risk. Um, I understand that trade off. We can talk about that as well. Um, but what we do know is that 14 days after Memorial Day and all them folks went out, the numbers started going up again. Mm -hmm. And 14 days from the end of these protests, well, from when these protests started, we're beginning to see those numbers go up. So when people say, I ain't got sick yet. <laughs> Key, word is yet. <laughs> <laughs> Key word is yet. <laughs> Key word is yet. Right. Dr. Allen, before you answer, I just wanted to add a little bit to what you said, Dr. Benjamin, because I think you're being very generous when you say there was a game plan. I mean, I think that's one of the problems in the Black community and maybe in the community at large is, there, is that there was a lack of a game plan. And so that allowed people's conspiracy theories to oh, yeah. fester. Yeah. That allowed and when black people were placed in a position where we were the garbage workers, the, the, the sanitation people at hospitals, the nurses, the doctors, the bus drivers, the grocery store clerks, 
when we are disproportionately filling those jobs and we don't have clear information, and so our choice is feed my family or kind of sort of take a chance on this thing that nobody really knows about. Mm -hmm. So we're put in this double bind um, because we weren't given clear, accurate information. And then by the time information started rolling out, and I think um, by the time the public health department started standing up and saying, okay, we're not going to get none from the top. So let us push this stuff out. People were already so far dispersed and so far distracted that now we're trying to like herd cats to say, hey, no, no, listen, this is real. And I know you haven't got it yet, but it's, you know, this is, it comes in waves. And so we're, we're fighting on multiple levels. And as you said, um, Dr. Benjamin, and we will probably get into that further about black people and our jobs and why we're out there and why we have the underlying health conditions and all that kind of stuff. But I really believe wholeheartedly that the, the lack of a clear plan in the beginning is what allowed this scatter and spread of so many different theories and ideas about what it was okay to do. Well, you're right. It was a secret plan. <laughs> <laughs> I knew the plan. I knew Oscar knew the plan. But the folks at the White House didn't tell nobody. And yeah. we were all sitting around saying, when y'all going to tell folks about the plan? And they didn't. And you, you're absolutely right, Dr. Rosen. The health departments began articulating that plan. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem is, in fact, when they started, people started talking about it, they only talked about the stay at home part. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk about the rest of it. And so you're right, it was a very poorly thought through plan. And, and, and in fact, as you may remember, there was really didn't want to have a plan in the first place. Right. They didn't want to talk about it in the first place. Right. And I think what shocked me was the fact that that's never happened before. Mm -hmm. Every other time we've had a public health emergency, the federal government had stepped up to the plate. Now, I may not have agreed with everything they were doing, but they stepped up to the plate. There was leadership. CDC was given daily briefings. If it was infectious, FEMA was talking, sometimes talking stuff they didn't know what they were doing, but, but at least they were talking every day. <laughs> you know, think, I'm thinking Katrina. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there was some communication. There was some community engagement. None of that happened early enough here. Now, we know in retrospect, there was a lot of people within the government of goodwill that were trying to get the messages out, but they were being stifled. Mm -hmm. And you're right, vacuums abhor um, lack of knowledge. They just fill the space. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Allen, as you jump in, can you also um, tell us uh, what NACHO stands for? I, I apologize, I didn't read that in the bio. Sure, it's fine. It's NACHO. 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 I know people love, they love the cheese. I, I know. You just told me you went out partying, so I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> so NACHO stands for the National Association of County and City Health Officials. Uh, unlike our sister agency, American Public Health Association, we represent a facet of the public health, I was going to say enterprise, the local governmental uh, city and county health departments. Uh, so myself, as I mentioned, I spent 16 years as a local epidemiologist, uh, as you kind of articulated, dealing with these types of emergencies. And to George's point, we always have been focused on plans. In fact, I saw someone uh, that I, I spoke at a, a venue a number of years ago, and he said to me, we always remember that you always ask what kept you up at night and you always would say a pandemic mm -hmm. and now we have a pandemic and i will tell you and, and george is everyone we, we talked about it we made plans about it we didn't want to see it happen but we did at least try to develop plans mm -hmm. on how to address it every it, I, I can tell you we, and for the life of us it's the execution of the or the lack thereof of an execution of a plan from a centralized set you know perspective that has really caused us a lot of angst. And I say that because local health departments, state health departments, and as a local, you know, for 3,000 health departments out there, we always would say, if something happens, give the feds about maybe, maybe four, 48 hours. Realistically, maybe a week. If you are a suburban county or a rural county, expect the trucks to be passing by going to the big city, okay, it may be a little bit long. But there was never the expectation that the, uh, the ownership of the leadership of, of 
how to address and, and execute these type of uh, nationalized perspective for an issue that is such a national perspective, we have never experienced something to the extent of what we've experienced now. Um, shift in the responsibility from the federal entity to that of the state. And as you saw the whole issues with all the states competing for PPE and all these things that we've been saying we need and there's been a decimation of the uh, health system. And when we say health system, we're not just speaking hospitals. That's another problem that people only think about hospitals. There's an enterprise that consists of a whole pantheon of folks who are at the front lines trying to address these particular issues on top of other things. So from the lens of where we sit as a National Association of County and City Health Officials, it, it was maddening, and it still is, uh, to recognize that there were opportunities that were lost. There's information, there's, there's the need to provide data and to give clear understanding. I, I, I'll give Zika as an example. Would you have ever imagined that there's a mosquito-borne disease that you can catch sexually? We would have said no, we, it never happened. But Zika showed us that things progress, you learn more, you communicate more. So health experts are not gonna know everything. And this particular pandemic is so named because it's new. It is not acting like its cousins, SARS and theirs. It's acting very differently. Uh, we're seeing more information uh, and more, more details as it has progressed through our, our population. But the point is as a health professional, we would always prefer to make sure we can tell you, the public, what we know and what we don't know. And hopefully what we're trying to execute in an effort to ensure that we get a better handle of it. You know, some of us have the expectation that everybody at some point in time will be exposed to this particular virus. Some people say, well, not everyone, but to be honest, if it's new, it's, it's novel, there is an opportunity that we recognize in George's point not everyone's exposed at the outset. This is going to take a marathon. And it's important for us to, as people of color, uh, as anyone, any citizen in, in, in our society, to recognize that there is that social compact, not only from what the governmental, medical, and the other field, but also the personal responsibility and trying our best to minimize the impact that this is having on the lives of our communities. Is there anything, I mean, because you're, you, this is like mind blowing in a sense of that possibly all of us will get this, right? And seeing how it's ravaged certain people, specifically black people and our community when we get it, like, are there things beyond, you know, to prevent wash your hands, mask, six feet apart. So we said those are the, the prevention steps. Are there things we can do right now to ramp up our immune system, especially given we're under all this other stuff, this pressure and racial justice trauma, like what can we do so that we can win or if we get it, we can fight it better? Well, you know, obviously, you know, um, um, get physically fit. And I know I need to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, eat nutritiously. And um, if you have any chronic disease, make sure your chronic disease is, is in good control. Diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, chronic lung disease. Um, I would encourage you, if you smoke, because I'm always going to tell people, if you smoke, get, get, you know, get, stop smoking, get therapy so you can stop. Does that include all types of smoking? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Vaping is just as bad. That's a legitimate question because you have people, and I know you know this, all three of you doctors in the medical community who feel like cigarette smoking and, and marijuana smoking are two different types of smoking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Anything, anything that causes inflammation in your lungs um, other than clean air, you know, <laughs> causes inflammation, <laughs> makes you more at risk of getting sicker if you get exposed to this virus. Especially seeing that it is a respiratory infection that does cause very negative outcomes. I had literally this conversation last week with someone who lives with me and they were like, you know, now I don't pass joints. I only, you know, you got to roll and smoke your own. I was like, <laughs> I was like see, we safe, but now, oh Lord Jesus. Well, 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 that is true. One of the ways you get it is by, you know, drinking after someone or smoking after someone. That is a possibility to get it that way. So theoretically, not passing and sharing your joint reduces your risk from one person to another, but does not reduce your individual risk. 
I think STAR, in addition to the things that um, Drs. Benjamin and Allen said, is really taking some ownership about getting accurate information and sharing that with the people we care about, because without accurate information, we can't make good decisions. I mean, at this point in the pandemic, everybody is going to have to figure out how to start trying to live. Pretty soon, we're going to have to start thinking about taking our kids to school. And so there's a lot of decisions that we are going to need to make. Um, and so we need good information. And what we know now after three months is that we're not going to get that from White House briefings, from the CDC in a timely manner. And so if you, if you maybe follow, you know, NATO or maybe you follow APHA or, or something, but try to find information that's digestible that can help you make good decisions, for, just good decisions for you and your family. Um, because, you know, I, I hadn't thought about this, but one of my daughter's moms was saying that she was getting nervous about school starting because her daughters take the bus. Now I have the luxury of driving my daughters to school. So it didn't occur to me. And I'm like, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of kids that ride city buses, school buses, um, and we don't hear those conversations. I'm not saying they're not happening, but we don't hear them. And this when we've talked about civic engagement and getting involved in local communities and local advisory councils, that's where those kind of conversations are happening. And black people are not sitting at those tables and our kids are disproportionately affected because more of us are taking the city buses and the school buses. And more of us have not the capacity to drive our kids to school because of our own jobs. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have to get at the right tables and we have to start um, getting good information and sharing that good information um, and supporting each other when we're trying to pass on good information. If I can add to that there, are, and I'll use this concept of the three. First, as you kind of mentioned earlier, Star, that folks said, well, I went to the protest and I didn't get sick. Well, give it two or three weeks. I yeah. guarantee you, we will see some outcome. I'm not saying you personally, Hopefully you did wear a mask, you did, you know, hygiene as well. I mean, granted uh, hand hygiene with respect to, uh, but recognize that not everyone did that. But our concern is that in two to three weeks, we will begin to see an additional amount of cases result as a, as a cause of that. It's just, it's inevitable to that extent. Um, that's, and, and that's me speaking as an epidemiologist, right? Um, now, secondarily, the other component of that principle of three, we have the pandemic, right? We also have the other pandemic, which is we recognize the issues we will talk about in a few minutes. And then we have a third pandemic of disinformation. Mm -hmm. When I have people who are sharing Facebook pages saying, when a vaccine comes, I will not take it because they're trying to microchip or trying to kill my, you know, uh, kill people. Or one even better, uh, when they were talking about community-based testing, don't go get tested for, for COVID because they're trying to chip you. Like, but if you don't know, if you don't get tested, you don't know if you have this particular illness. Well, Dr. And Allen, as, how do we, we have such a distrust in our community for government officials and a history that shows things like when you think of the Tuskegee experiment that people keep referencing that I see across social media, how do we, especially with you working with local, you know, uh, counties and stuff, like how do we build that trust up to not be afraid of, well, is this vaccine going to harm me? Is this vaccine going to be linked to something else? Especially when you think about these minority communities, like what, what are some things that we can even start to, you know, even imagine that this is the, it's the truth, especially when there's been a lack of information that's even been given down. Like there is a real fear of understood. people. And, and, and I apologize. Um, I, it's, it's a real fear and I totally understand it. And uh, I can tell you that several of us are in public health. We live and bred the whole story of Tuskegee. And the first thing I say to people say, well, Tuskegee, I said, well, Tuskegee was them, when I say them, a group of scientists uh, totally with CDC who did not treat known cases of syphilis. It wasn't that they didn't give them a vet, they did not treat them properly. They, they, allowed, they allowed the disease to progress through its natural cycle and wreak havoc on those uh, unfortunate um, African-American males that were part of that particular study. Testing, getting a swab, is not Tuskegee. You know, it is not an effort to say, we're taking information and we are infecting you with disease. It's a simple, it's two, there are two types of tests. A nasal swab, which detects whether you're actively shedding virus, and a blood 
a blood sample which sees whether or not you've had uh, any antibodies, uh, meaning that you had a previous exposure. So when folks like to, or folks automatically go to the distrust because of Tuskegee, I try to break that down. And I know not everyone loves history to get into those, to, 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 get, to um, get into that separation, but those are two distinct things. Um, and I clearly can say Tuskegee was an issue of a lack of ethics and a lack and, and part of the structural racism that we see uh, that has proliferated in our, in our society now. Now we are in a pandemic. And we need to do one thing of, of several things that we have not been able to avail ourselves of. At least find out the level of disease that exists in our population. And the only way we can adequately get that is before people get hospitalized is by getting tested. And that should allows us to know. For, should we push for the nasal or the blood test? Because like, I know like I, my doctor, she's offering, cause she, you know, she costs a whole lot of money, but you can go and she'll do the blood test. Or should I be like, go to the county testing center where like anyone can drive up and let them stick something up my nose? But those are different oh. tests for different purposes, Star. Oh. So you don't choose which one is more convenient for you. It depends on whether you're looking or presenting with acute symptoms or whether you're looking to see if you have been exposed but not gotten ill. So two very different tests. So a person could actually need both tests at different times in their journey. Um, and I like to say, you know, Dr. Allen, in, in the mental health field, I used to tell my patients all the time, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean somebody's not out to get you, but you still have a responsibility to get accurate information so you can try to figure out the difference. And that's where I think people um, will bring up historical fact that is very accurate and very mm -hmm. true and very real, but that doesn't mean you don't make good healthcare choices today, right? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that systemic racism and healthcare disparities are not still real, but mm -hmm. you still have to make good healthcare choices today and you cannot excuse yourself from making good choices with good information because of the things that happened to our ancestors. Can I remind people that Tuskegee, first of all, it was, it was community-based research. Mm -hmm. There were African-Americans involved in that research. Mm -hmm. The original concept of the research made sense, meaning there was no treatment. Let's follow these folks and find out what syphilis does to them. The problem was that when treatment came available, they did not tell them they had syphilis and they did not treat them. That was, that was the, 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 the research um, uh, problem when that happened. Now, I also remind folks that the people that blew the whistle on Tuskegee were also at CDC and were also, also African-Americans. So this was not something that, you know, now there were some white guys that tried to get it out, but it was, and, and ultimately a white guy made it public but the brothers and sisters at CDC, um, you know, as they say, when they let us in the room, figured it out and blew the whistle. Now, there are many things that have changed to try to put better protections in today. I cannot promise you that someone won't continue to misuse research, but we, we have to have research. We have to participate in research um, because the, the real problem is, is that if African Americans are not involved in the research studies around vaccines, how are we going to know, particularly in a, in a disease like this, which we know does have some impact on the immune system, whether or not it's going to work in everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. Um, and there are some trade-offs here that, that we absolutely have to do. Um, but we, we have to be careful that, that we don't let, um, that we learn from the past and we don't let rumors mm -hmm. get in our way of knowledge. So we need to read. When someone tells us something, don't just believe it. Don't just forward it. <laughs> it's true before you do it. Okay, I almost did it yesterday. Found something, it was a, it was a juicy one too. I don't know exactly what it was, but I was, I was looking at it. Boy, I, I looked at my wife and said, oh, this is a juicy one. And she looked it up and said, no, 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 no. <laughs> that ain't right. <laughs> so with that with that said is it with everything that's continuing to go on is the reality that our thought that since things are opening back up that we really should still be implementing staying at home like like can we go ahead and travel can we go ahead and go to that restaurant like as 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 two you know public health officials 
you know, what is your recommendation on that? Safety first. Safety in whatever you do, with the exception of going clubbing, safety first. We don't need to be going, we don't need to go, we don't need to go clubbing right now. There's some parts, there's some portions of the country where the clubs are open. Right, um, right. And, you know, and even, you know, even some of the mass gathering events, as I said, we understand why folks um, from, from the respect, I mean, there's that whole meme of, of folks that COVID was winning and, and then racism decided to show why it was a franchise, right? Racism superseded COVID. I get it. Um, but the reality is, is even in those scenarios, you got to be safe. So if you have to go out, if you have to travel, it's not like, oh, we're going back to spring break type of, uh, you know, everyone just go out, you know, chilling at, at, at Myrtle Beach or, 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 you know, oh, we saw what happened when it, when it went to Miami Beach. But the idea is be safe in what activities you go out there and do. Wear your mask, you know, have practice hand hygiene, keep that safe physical distance. If you can't at least keep the physical distance, hand hygiene, masks, gloves, because it is not that time for us to act like everything is cool because the summer's out, we got to get the nice outfits and just be out as if, you know, now, now, now we're out of the winter. This, thing, this virus has not gone away. And, and, and I know people feel that, okay, I haven't gotten sick. Well, 25% of the people at least have asymptomatic spread. So people don't know they gotten sick or not. They may very well have the disease. The problem is not so much if you don't get sick. The problem is that if you get sick and you spread it to grandma um, or your other family members. Uh, and we also know that at least as we've looked at it so far, children in particular, except a small subset, a very small set of, set of kids who get really sick, um, do pretty well with this. Um, and, but as you know, there's some kids that get really sick, get, get very sick, but most kids don't. So yeah, a lot of the young folks that are out there um, probably don't have chronic diseases and are going to do okay. But for those folks that got, you know, 45 years of old age with high blood pressure and who are overweight, um, who haven't have early prediabetes, y'all at risk. And if I could, <laughs> this is this. So I'm going to use the example of uh, something that we saw from one of the CDC studies. And every every week, they probably release about three or four studies uh, on on publicly on the website. And one of those studies in March talked about 300 um, individuals who were hospitalized for COVID in Georgia. 300. Half of them were women. More than 70 percent black. 25% of them, one out of four, did not have an underlying health condition. Mm -hmm. So as to the point that we're all making as medical, as health professionals, there is risk factors that put you at a increased risk of illness. But there are also other things in play where you may seem to be relatively well, you may seem to be healthy, you may not know, or you may not have underlying health conditions, and you can still be hospitalized from this illness. So it tries to underscore how important and how impactful this disease can be if we are not diligent. You know, I, got a, I got a rumor question here. Is this rumor or not? So we, we know there's a ton of black respiratory therapists and a lot of them have been sharing that the, the part of the treatment of people that get hospitalized is what's causing a lot of the black people to expire rather quickly, right? So is that true or is that not like, is in intubating someone the way to go if they're not breathing like? Well, let me, let me it's, it's a nuanced answer. And the answer is that obviously, you know, the standard medical therapy is when you go into respiratory failure is we put people on a respirator. And what we've discovered is that, um, either because of the degree of the illness that they have. People that um, go on respirators have a higher mortality, mean more of them die. Um, but we've also learned that there are many, many ways now to manage people without putting them on a respirator um, to keep their oxygen levels up. 
And that's one of the learnings that we've had uh, of this disease. So it, it, the, the statement that they're making in, in some ways is, is true, but there's, the cause and effect may not be, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's something called proning. And proning is when you, you know, usually when you're in a, when you put on a respirator, picture that, they're on, you're on your back, you got a tube in, your, in your, your, your nose and your mouth down into your lung and you're on this breathing machine. Well, they've learned because of the way this disease impacts the lungs, that sometimes just simply putting people on their side or on their stomach improves their ability to breathe. Um, what about it, up? Like, like, it, it, like, let's say someone is listening to this and, they, and, and they're like, this is all great information. Maybe someone or themselves end up in the hospital and, and, and they're sitting on their back. Now they know, oh, I heard Dr. Benjamin say this could be effective. I know I'm not, you know, trying to put anything in your mouth, but, but is it also, can you as a, as a patient say, no, sit me up? Um, sure, sure. And, and I think one of the challenges is, is that, and this is on the doctor and nursing side of the, of, of the, of the equation, we don't discuss these things with patients. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is, is that in this disease process, you get it, and a lot of people are doing just fine. They get real sick. And then they're, they're on their way to recovery. And then all of a sudden, about a week later, they literally crash. Blood pressure drops, very much short of breath. And, and, and at that point, when they're going to the hospital, they're in, Christ, in a crisis state. They've not had the discussion with their family members about whether they want to be intubated or not. Uh, the doctors don't know them. They've not built a relationship with, the, with their clinician because they may not may or may not have a doctor. And so at that point, we, you know, as many of you know, I'm, I'm an old ER doc. Um, we do what we know. We know that if we put a tube in you and put you on a respirator, that generally makes people better. But we have learned from that experience. And so the really more sophisticated critical care doctors and ER doctors are learning better ways to keep your oxygen level up. Because in most cases, these people are still breathing. Mm -hmm. It's just that their oxygen level is so low. And what you're trying to do is raise the level of their oxygen higher. Um, so again, like I said, it's a nuanced answer. Um, but as, as, as Oscar pointed out, every day we learn something new about this disease. And my best example of that is, remember we told you right away early on, everybody didn't need to wear a mask? And that was because we didn't think that there was asymptomatic spread. At least we didn't think it was a lot of it. Well, it turns out it's a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're saying everybody ought to wear a mask now. And if I can add to, um, so think of, a, think of a pyramid. The pyramid, the top of the pyramid, people who died. The next round, hospitalized. Others believe that the medically, you know, uh, folks that may or may not, then you have, uh, who may or may not seek medical attention. Then as you get to the bottom of this pyramid, you have symptomatic and then infected asymptomatic. So my point is, there, if you look at the number of people who died, there are far more people that are infected. If you look at the people that are hospitalized, there may be more than the number of people who are dying, but they're still a larger foot base in, in that pyramid. So if we're only focusing on things by the time our people get in the hospital and have to be intubated, guess what? We've missed this entire population, this entire base of the pyramid, because we're just focused on the apex. And while the apex is the only way we can actually detect, you know, what is the presence of the illness and the impact of the illness, it is imperative for us to try to make sure before we get to the hospitalization and the death portion that at least we're doing what's important so that we don't get there. We, we don't get to the fact of the only way you're going to know this is if you get hospitalized because we don't want that to be point when it's too late. And Dr. Allen, as a, as a, as a student truly of science, is it, and I've seen this argument again, and this isn't, I guess, maybe a rumor, maybe not. Does the mask really help anything? Like if you don't have one of those N5, whatever them type masks are, or a real hospital mask, and people like you see people making their own. You, I've seen people make a crochet mask. I, I mean, all types of masks you've seen. But let's say you just have a generic uh, mask that you might see, you know, at a nail salon or something like one of those uh, dollar ones or something. Is that truly helping at all? Like, is it really preventing anything? First, I would say this. 
if you have a mask on and we could see your nose, you don't have a mask on. Right. Okay. Let well, me you know first. Black people, we ain't covering their nose up. I'm gonna just tell you that. <laughs> but it defeats the point of the facial covering and the barrier. Right. The barrier is there to one protect you from shedding and spreading. Um, what we call it for my shedding virus, and from the other person from ex their self shedding virus that will expose you to it. And if we're looking fly and we got, you know, a cute or whatever, and we got the nose, the mask on our nose, guess what you're doing? You may not be speaking, but you're breathing. But we can't And you're breathe. exhaling. Like the, it, like it the is hard. It is <laughs> hard. But, but let's, let's, let's make this common sense. If I'm in your face and I'm spitting all over, your, all over you when I'm talking to you, right, then I'm too close. Right. And if I have a mask on, Whatever's coming out of my mouth is not going in your face. Now, can it go around it if it's a real small particle? Of course it can. But I'm reducing dramatically the amount of spittle that comes out of my mouth and spittle. into your face. <laughs> and if you have one on and I have one on, then both of us are better protected. It ain't 100%. Right. But common sense says I'm better protected. Now, what I also have not to do is I have to cover up my nose, like, like Dr. Lane says, and I got to wear the mask properly, and I got to take it off properly so I don't contaminate my hands. You know, you take the mask off, and then you, you, you scratch your nose, because you got to pick your nose, because that's what we do, you know? <laughs> my nails. Yeah, well, I'm going to infect myself if the mask itself is infected. So we, we know that... Um, this is a different disease now, okay? When we had Ebola, we knew that those people were all the, all that, all the zoot suits with all that fancy stuff on, and the people got infected because they didn't take their gowns and, and, and hats and masks and stuff off safely, contaminated their hands, and then got infected. Well, the same thing happens if you wear a mask with, with this COVID or SARS virus, and you contaminate your hands, and then if you touch your your nose and your mouth, you're likely to, to you know, to get infected. Yeah, not 100%. Can you reuse the mask? Because like Sasha said, there are people that are using these like cloth masks and crochet. Is that safe? You have to wash it, clean it. Okay. And, and, and stay away from the crochet mask, please. Don't wear the crochet mask. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty now. I like them. <laughs> if you want to make a fashion statement, that's fine. And wear around the house. Well, Dr. T, though. Or, or, you, or if you want to wear it on top of another mask, yeah. then that's cool. If you want to conceal and, yeah. But, but it's Dr. like wearing nothing. Sorry. And why, I, are I, white, why are the white people going crazy over wearing masks? Like, they are, like, ready to riot and pick it. They ain't worried about necessarily this racial pandemic. But, like, these white people, go, they walked into the state capitals with loaded automatic weapons over wearing uh -huh. masks. What is you know that? what we ought to do? You know what we ought to do? We ought to mandate wearing a hard hat, something they're used to wearing. I have no idea why people are upset wearing a mask, but would never think of not wearing a hard hat or still show um, still toed shoes at the job. You know, no, they've they've made it political. They've yeah, made yeah. a political argument, which it does not need to be. And we're still gonna take care of them because they're gonna get sick. Right. Yeah. If I so one of the things, and, and to segue into that conversation, that has been the most troubling to the public health professionals, um, <laughs> both on the ground and, it's, and everywhere else, is that in this story about this pandemic, public health is, in any kind of diseases, public health are usually the unsung heroes. The folks are in the background, they're doing stuff, they're not, they're not flashy, they're not rolling in with the flashy cars, they're just getting the job done. But in this current story, somehow the other public health has become the villain. We are now the villain in this response because for some of the reason, the public health measures to protect people from dying, to ensure that we slow down the, the rapid spread of this infection so it doesn't mimic what we saw in 1918 pandemic flu or any of the other diseases that we've been dealing with, that somehow we are the reason, the cause for the destruction of American civil liberties, et cetera. And that's, that's the furthest from the truth. And it boggles our minds as to why people have now look, look at the public health enterprise as the enemy. We're not an enemy. 
especially as Georgia said, when we're trying to save lives. I mean, they're over, uh, they're over 70,000, if I'm not mistaken, no, no not 70,000, 7,000 or so healthcare workers that have become sick uh, and many that have died. And to your point even earlier, the essential workers, they're not just the, the nurses and the doctors, it's the janitors, it's the bus drivers, it's uh, the sanitation workers, all of these individuals, the essential people who have to go into harm's way to clean the buses, to clean the trains, to get folks transported back and forth because quote unquote, the shutdown wasn't really a shutdown. People were still out working. You know, essential jobs are still happening. You know, commerce was still happening to some extent. So this whole concept that, hey, we just had a full quarantine, it was not like Spain, where they literally had uh, um, police cars and army driving through the streets to say, get the hell out of the street at five o'clock, there's a curfew. None of that stuff happened. Of course, now with the protests, they did, but you get my point. So, I mean, I, I could, I think, I, I'm so tempted to pivot politically, but I'm going to try <laughs> to get us out of here before, <laughs> before midnight. Um, but I think it's very clear um, why the healthcare profession enterprise has been vilified, because they had that base that feels like they have the civil liberties to do any and everything they want. We're told, well, if you listen to me, you're going to be just fine. You don't need to worry about this. They're the ones making this a big deal. And, and that's the way that this current administration, you know, bifurcates and splits and vilifies. That's the way they work. But to pivot, <laughs> um, in the sense that part of the show is where do we go from here? You know, I think part of the problem is people now have decision fatigue, right? They have made so many decisions about what to do, when to do it, how to do it, what's safe. They, some people have tried to get information, some people haven't, but everybody has decision fatigue. And so, and in the beginning of this, because of that misinformation, you know, people believed it was going to be a couple of weeks, right? And now we're three months in and we're really knowing that this is going to be, as you said, a marathon. And this is going to be an extended period of thinking about every single thing that you do and how important is it? And I tell my patients, like, is it worth your life? Like, just use that as your barometer. Until we have a better barometer, <laughs> use that as your barometer. And so I think this decision fatigue is what's wearing people down and it's making them make bad choices because we know when you're tired, you don't think as well as when you're alert and when you're at your best. And I, and I know you, you know, so for me, also, people have been home, they don't have time, well, they have time in their hands. I can't tell you how many amateur epidemiologists and statisticians that I've seen on social media. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, people, people <laughs> like, <laughs> we're not going to get to those. <laughs> but the fact, I mean, I remember going to school and what it took to learn epidemiology and statistical analysis, and I'm sitting here watching people, people who, you know, know that I'm an epidemiologist and a trained epidemiologist and an experience, and they're like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, what the heck? Where, 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 where did this happen? Like, why, why did I take time to go to school? If all I needed was two months on social media and now I'm an epi, I mean, that, that would have been great. Georgia should have told me this years ago. But you know, speaking, speaking of, is it, and, 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 you know, one, I guess, I don't know if it was a rumor question, is it really possible that people could have had this last year? Because that's another yeah. thing we've seen is though, I've seen the, the, the people say in December, I had all of these symptoms. Is that, is that a possibility? The evidence, the, the laboratory serology evidence of everyone, even those individuals, unless we had samples of folks back then, does not indicate that prior to December, we know, prior to December, we've been able to prove that there were cases in the US. I'm not saying that that's, it never happened. We just have not been able to prove it with the laboratory evidence that we have uh, and given where the spread of the virus has uh, proceeded. And remember in December, one thing people also need to, re to realize, we were also in the height of, uh, as we would say, the second wave of rest normal respiratory illness. So there was respiratory illness that was percolating, was permeating through uh, communities, whether it's flu or other uh, you know, RSV and other 
other respiratory diseases that occur, but we have this acuity, this high, heightened sense. So people would say, well, maybe it was December. I, we just can't prove it with any kind of laboratory-based evidence to confirm that yes, there were confirmed cases before uh, in December. I have one last question. I, I guess this is for everybody, but definitely Dr. T. So like, as we look at, this is gonna be a marathon and we really are gonna have to self-isolate to varying degrees for a very long time, it seems. How do we handle like loneliness and isolation and just that impact? Because I'm, I mean, and I'm a, I'm a, a, a person who loves her isolation, and I'm even like, you know, I'm ready to go to club. I'm ready to go out, go to the beach, but I want to be safe and I want to keep my family safe. How do we handle that, especially people that are are single or living alone? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's a very real, um, very real thing that people are struggling with and being home even if you're going to work it's not the same as being social right you especially in this environment when people who work that have on masks they're you know they're not really socializing and interacting so it's a very real dynamic that people are, are trying to struggle and and figure out but i i say the same thing that i've been saying all along is you have to use your best judgment right so the more you expose yourself, the more dense the environment that you put yourself in, the more likely you are going to risk being in contact with someone who may have the virus and can spread it to you. So you probably could maybe go to a, a, a gathering of a few friends who are having barbecue. But for instance, I have a friend that for most of the last three months, has been in her house with her husband and their dog and they haven't gone anywhere. But then a couple of weeks ago, she went and hung out with some friends who rented a yacht and then they went to Miami and then they, and so I'm like, okay, you're off the list of people that I can visit until you've been quarantined for another couple of weeks. And so you have to use some, some thinking skills, right? You're gonna have things that you, you have to shop and it, you know, at some point people may need to go buy clothes um, cause like me, I can't buy clothes online. I, it just doesn't work for me. Right. So everybody's just going to have to keep using that good judgment. Keep asking themselves that question. Is this gathering worth my life? Right. And so, and how well do I know, how well do I know the people and their habits that I'm going to be surrounding myself with. The more dense, the bigger the gathering, the less likely you're going to be able to have any confidence in knowing who those people have been exposed to. But Dr. T, what about the people who are saying this depression may take my life that I'm feeling being at home? Yeah, I'm not saying don't be around people. I'm saying be smart around who you're around, right? So, you know, and like, for instance, one of my daughters just had a to a set of twins who had a 17th birthday. And so this girl, two girls with their mom and dad have been in the house for months. And their mom asked, and so right across the street um, in my little subdivision, there's a little park. So they brought camping chairs, they sat six feet apart, had their mask on, and they chatted outside in the open air. It was four of them, right? And so you can find ways to be social. You can find ways. I'm not suggesting that you hug. I'm not suggesting that you kiss. I'm not even suggesting that you elbow and fist bump, right? I'm suggesting that you continue to be close to people who you can have some degree of confidence about who they've been in contact with. And then um, you still keep your distance from them. If I can add. Absolutely. We are a resilient people. Mm -hmm. unquestionably undeniably and we have been through hell in a handbasket and have been and find ways to innovate how we can weather the storm i'll give you one quick example i just saw a photo today of a couple guys in a playground playing dominoes they set up, they had their dominoes table they set up plexiglass around all four corners they had little windows and they were wearing their mask and they had hand hygiene so that they could play dominoes. Now, they were being sociable. We would have been like, well, wait a minute, what do you do really? But they found a way to innovate, still to have this community level of engagement while at the same time trying to be safe. That's innovative, that's resiliency. Mm -hmm. So the idea is 
what can we do to help address those issues with separation, especially the fact that we're oftentimes a social people. And the social interaction is probably one of the reasons why people don't like the term social distancing, but the social interaction is obviously what drives certain folks, right? What, what is that life birth energy of, of the feeling the energy off others? So we can still do some of that, just we have to be innovative and safe in how we go through this. And it won't be forever, right? We recognize there's phases. We just don't want things to just open the floodgates and just everyone start rushing out and say, we're, oh, it's time to go and hang out. No, take things in baby steps, go through the different phases. As we start to see progression and be able to reduce flare-ups, then we can open more of the door and get back to that. So it's just a matter of being safe, resilient, and innovative while at the same time protecting our lives. Dr. Benjamin, can you add any last closing words as we wrap this up? Look, we were never going to be in our homes forever. Um, and I think um, Dr. Lane's point about getting out and doing so safely is the way to go. And, you know, for, for your listeners, um, I just want to remind you that he is a Black epidemiologist. He does not just play one on TV. <laughs> I can assure you he knows what he's doing. So when he tells you what to do, and you think you need an expert, that's the guy. And I would just, I would just encourage people to make sure they're looking at accurate sources of information. You use your phone for everything else, fact check something before you spread that information or before you base a good decision on it. This is, um, even though we have decision fatigue and we're tired of thinking about these things, we still need to do this for several, several, many, many more months to do what's best for ourselves, for our children, for our families, for our community. And so let's not give up Let's not get tired this early in the game. It's only been four months. I mean, it seems like it's been very long. <laughs> but let's, let's not, you know, we screwed up the first four months. Let's not screw up the next six. He said only like it was like, it's only been four months. Like, <laughs> like we do. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm in this chair for three. <laughs> <laughs> you the life and I just got to prison. I'm like, oh my. <laughs> I got two things, <laughs> of course, right? So my last two things are going to be about, you know, this is a marathon, this is not a sprint, and keeping that in the back of my head of like, okay, you got to make good choices. This, it's not over. So just keep reminding myself it's not over. And then the second thing is more around the beauty of this conversation. We have three doctors, three experts in their own distinguished fields. Um, and so last, we are our greatest resource. I, there is a lot of fear in the Black community. I know me even myself, I only have Black doctors because I, to a degree, I, I don't trust non-Black doctors. And I've had neg very negative experiences in the medical, in the world of, of medicine, not having a Black doctor who could speak to me in a way I could receive and who could advocate for me. So we are our greatest resource. And apparently there's a bevy of us in the science and technology field. So why don't we go reach out to them and ask them the questions versus like the internet and Facebook. So. And Uncle John and Auntie Sue, right? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely... Uh, <laughs> you know, reiterate star sentiments. It, it's, it's amazing. First of all, I, I thank you gentlemen for coming on with us and, and speaking to us at Star Set in ways that we can receive because the questions that we're asking are not only questions that some of us have thought ourselves, but questions that we're seeing and, and oftentimes language that I'm sure you all speak that when we read a, a epidemiology report that we don't speak that language. So <laughs> the reality is, is that having this conversation is a great start um, and one, you know, hoping to try to build the trust within our community and within our community professionals. I read an article recently that actually talked about, and I reshared it, that, and I said the title was misleading, but the read was interesting. And, and I saw tons of people reshare it prior to me that said that the article was basically about we, um, Black participants needed for, to basically know if COVID, how COVID um, uh, vaccines would work. 
and everyone so people were sharing it saying like you know basically like oh they're trying to set us up they're trying to have black participants because they want to kill us well when you read the article the title was terrible but when you read the actual article it had a numerous amount of black professionals in the science field who were basically giving real reason real you know quantitative qualitative research as to why black participants were needed not on the basis of someone trying to harm them but on the basis of trying to see how things work and i and i give that example in the sense of i've been in the hospital before where um my body reacts differently to medications just just like the next person and so understanding the why you know is something that that we need to have but people are very very afraid of science um be, there is history with it but you know the hope is that seeing more people like yourselves can start to like at least have the conversation, at least encourage us to do the research that's needed for the things that we come across uh, and, 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 and at least make our own opinions on things. I know that I'm not at a phase where I'm willing to go to the club, but for me personally, you know, I'm at a phase where I'm comfortable with going to an outdoor dining space within safety parameters. And I know that we have to make our own decisions for ourselves. Um, and, and as you know, both of you, you have said, you know, be logical, even Dr. T, be logical about that. Ask yourself the certain risk and things of that nature. So, you know, I thank you for coming on, for talking to us, for helping us understand, because there's been a lot of questions. And as the world is opening back up, we, you know, we wanted to know, like, what does that include us? Because we're, we haven't been sure. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for being It's good to see you. And we out, y'all. Oscar, I owe you a call.